Remember the, the area on the background of the photo that the quality of that blur is what the industry calls bokeh. Bokeh? Bokeh. Bokeh. Professional bokeh. Bokeh. Ka. Bigger, deeper pixels. Ooh. That background and the quality of that bokeh So today, which has been declared National Deeper Pixels Day, Apple has released not one, but three phones. There is the iPhone XS, the iPhone XS Max, and the iPhone XR. Naturally, these are three expensive, but unusually powerful phones. I'm so happy we still have this. So in light of the video that I posted yesterday, and I kind of went off on all the camera companies because here, you need to buy all this stuff. And of course, Apple does this every year. I'm gonna weigh in on this because even though it's the same camera, we don't have a new one in the phone, there are some really interesting things about this phone that I think are going to get exciting down the road. So the big feature is the processor that's in the phone. It's amazing. It's like, I used to say, you know, when phones would come out, you know, this phone is like way more faster and more powerful than computers that I had when I started. It's blown that away now. I mean, it's ridiculous the amount of processing power. I think they're boasting five trillion calculations per second, something like that. And when they did the photography segment and they were going through and mispronouncing Japanese words, etc., they were talking about the features that would be possible on this phone. And of course, the big one is this portrait mode, which has been on phones for a long time. So if you're not familiar, portrait mode is kind of the rage in all the smartphones these days. And basically what it does is it takes a picture of someone and it kind of maps out where their face is, et cetera, and then tries to apply this Gaussian blur filter that smooths out around the edges of the face and tries to emulate bokeh. Stop there. On this channel, I have made many videos. How many times, for those of you who followed me for a long time, have heard me talk about bokeh? So this is a Japanese word, and mainly what it refers to are the out-of-focus areas in the image and how pleasing they are to the eye. And a lot of times, people will do lens reviews, and I understand that lenses become very mathematical, very complex, and very boring really quick. So usually this is like, you see a lens review, and somebody shoots it wide open a bunch, and then like talks about the amazing bokeh. I'm not a big fan of this. I know it's a part of the image. It's part of the aesthetic. I feel like people use it as a compositional crutch a lot of times, but it's smooth and it's blurry and it's something that people want on their cell phone images. Here's the fundamental problem of a cell phone. You have a teeny tiny little sensor as opposed to an APS-C or full frame or medium format or something like that. And it's just kind of the laws of optics that get in the way because essentially, even though you have a smaller sensor and they are capable of producing very sharp images and they're very high quality, you were using essentially, I should have looked this up because I don't know what is offhand, an eight millimeter lens or maybe even less on a cell phone. This is super wide and it's really hard to get your bokeh or your separation of depth of field, knocking a background out in a portrait, for example, out of a optic that size. Let me give you an example. Hold on one second. This is cheese. I bought it at the store. It's pretty good cheese. They have a little under $5 bin where you can buy remnants of a much larger block of cheese. This is good cheese. This is cheese. It says it's made with real cheese. And I suppose that if you and your dinner guests have had enough wine to drink, this could pass for this cheese. This is a nice lens. It's designed to space out glass elements and put them into groups and basically channel the light into something that looks really nice on the camera sensor. This is also a lens. And there's not a lot of space for those elements and groups, and it has to be really wide because the sensor's tiny. This is obviously an extremely oversimplified comparison between this Zeiss lens and my iPhone, but my point is, is that they are two very different animals. And what's actually interesting is there has been a lot of research that has gone into designing optics for smartphones. And if you go over to Zeiss's website and you go dig into their white papers, they have a lot of their research that they've released on there. And it's kind of interesting to see what they've done because the sensors are capable of doing some pretty amazing things, and phones have come a lot long way, as everybody here knows. Let's just say the optics don't really include bokeh as one of those elements necessarily. That's why I compared it to Easy Cheese. And as we talk about cameras, of course, everyone talks about the sensors and the lens, and rightly so, they're an important part of the camera system. But increasingly, what makes incredible photos possible aren't just the sensor and the lens, but it's the chip and the software that runs on it. And this is so true with iPhone photography. 
See, that's actually where this is gonna get exciting because when we get into this area of what you can do with a processor in addition to optics and how that can be manipulated, we get into this territory of computational imaging. And when I had the light L16 with all the lenses, it's over there somewhere, that is an example of an experiment with computational imaging. And smartphones have a lot that they can do with that too, but I think we've barely started to see the tip of the iceberg on this. Like right now, you have two lenses in your smartphone, you've got a telephoto and a wide, and it can switch between those. The Computational imaging comes into play when you do things like a panoramic image where you move the phone across and it starts stitching the image together and gives you this beautiful panorama that works really well. And it does things like the cheesy bokeh effect, which I'm not as into, obviously, but that's where we have computational imaging coming into play. And I don't think we've even scratched the surface with this yet because these are just two things that you can do with it. Where I think it's really gonna come into being very interesting is when we start seeing what third-party applications do. One of the things that's always drawn me to the app Apple ecosystem for better or worse, even before smartphones was third-party application support. And the types of third-party applications that we even had on the desktop early on before phones and have continued on have always been very impressive. And they've allowed me to do things on Apple computers that I can't do on others. And that's personal preference. Obviously apps are a huge part of the iPhone and it really took off when they added the App Store and this whole support for applications on there. Now, I think the most aggressive of these is obviously Adobe. And I don't think it's any mystery. I believe that Adobe have a vision one day of Lightroom Mobile doing pretty much everything you're able to do on the desktop. And they're moving in that direction now between Cloud Sync and I know there's two versions of Lightroom right now and it's a little bit confusing and I think they're working on closing that gap. It's a huge jump to do that and I commend Adobe for their work in that area. A lot of people don't like the subscription model still. Uh, you know, it is what it is. Um, if you want to use it, it's very powerful and I think that's where we're gonna start to see some stuff happen because Adobe obviously have the research and the dollars to throw at this and the team and the support and the corporate structure behind it to make it all happen. This is where it's really gonna get interesting. Other than that, is pretty much the same camera from the last model. I'm still rocking the iPhone 6S and my screen's now cracked, so it's probably time for me to upgrade, but this actually brings me to another point. And yesterday I did a video where I was calling out camera companies for this crazy marketing chaos that's going on right now and this 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 pressure for everyone to feel like they have to upgrade to this full frame mirrorless system which if you want to fine but I, I don't know it's just I had a rant about that I've calmed down one thing I will say about Apple though and I think this is a very tough game to be in when you're talking about smartphones or any kind of consumer electronics particular phones because it's kind of expected that there are new phones every year and I remember the first iPhone that I had was probably iPhone 3 or something like that and it used to be as many of you will recall that by the time the next year rolled around and they did the keynote, you couldn't wait for the phone to go on sale. You'd be willing to go stand in line because like your phone was falling apart. It was like held together with like, you know, tape and maybe bubble gum and wire and, it, you know, it, and then the, like the OS was just choking. It couldn't stand the weight of all the data you had on there. Phones have changed a lot. And the fact that I'm still using my 6S, I think is a testament because this phone's very usable and I don't feel like I have to upgrade tomorrow. And so that's one thing that I think Apple have handled very well because it's a tough business. You want people to buy the phones because that's a vicious cycle and it's very expensive to fund, I'm sure. Apple do just fine. I don't think there's a problem there. But the phones are lasting longer and I think that's a big deal actually. But this is where I want to hear from you. And actually, here's a little deal. I'm going to pick a comment at random and I'm going to give away one of these free Deeper Pixel shirts. Don't think we can give it to Phil. So here's the talking point. In light of the video that I did yesterday, and I'll link that up at the end of this one if you haven't seen it, smartphones have been a big problem for the camera industry. And when you consider Canon, Nikon, all the big players, for years and years before smartphones came along, you would have the casual enthusiast or somebody who was interested in photography or wanted to get some pictures, and they're willing to spend a little bit of money, and they'd buy the entry-level Nikon or Canon or what have you to go take photos of the kids or shoot family pictures or holidays or whatever that is. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that whole segment is gone because they're all using their smartphones. And in all fairness, a smartphone is going to give you more options in terms of what you can do with your images immediately in the moment. You can immediately text them to somebody. You can share them on Facebook or social media or whatever it is that you want to do. And so that segment is gone and that represented a huge chunk of those entry-level camera sales. And this is where our industry is starting to have some trouble now. And it's really interesting to see everybody seeing mirrorless as the savior here and I'm not sure that it is. 
But I want to hear from you guys. How important is a phone to you? Personally, for me, obviously I haven't upgraded in a long time. It's an important tool. It's an important device. I use it all the time. I use it for photography. It's usually more utilitarian for me because I am more interested in image quality and I realize that that's a minority. It probably is for the audience watching this as well. But I want to get some of your opinions on cell phones and what that means to you. I will see you guys in the next video. Until then, later. <laughs>